Hi guys, so I'm remaking the Jenna Wilson How to Survive video. Why? Because there's been some changes to how this case is gonna run. Um, so I'm gonna go through and treat it like you've never seen it before. Um, so this is our Jenna Wilson case. Um, you've got the video interview here, and then you're gonna notice something kind of strange. There's only two disciplines, and there's only one discipline director. Um, we have decided to kind of pump the brakes a little bit on how much content we're putting in each case. Um, now that is not to say that the only disciplines you will encounter are immunology and microbiology, but the only ones that will appear in the readiness assessment and the only information you need to answer all of the questions during the study activity come from me. Um, the reason is we originally had physiology and pathology in this section too, um, and we made the decision to cut those just to kind of slow down the amount of content. So I'm going to take a little more time to go through what you actually need to know in this packet, um, how maybe you might try studying for it, um, and then in the session we're certainly going to go through a lot of immunology and microbiology. We'll also touch on pathophysiology, which is really just getting at how some of the organisms that we're going to discuss here present. Um, but there isn't a pathophysiology section because actually the way that I'm presenting it, your pathophysiology discipline director, Anne Hartley, agreed with. So we decided to combine our readings into one section. And then we will go into those details during your um, self activities, your activities during the study, um, during the session. Okay, so here's your link to Jenna Wilson. Watch the full recording. You also have access to the full Jenna Wilson case on Entrada. Um, okay, so immunology. We're finally going to talk about complement. Um, I've been mentioning complement over and over and over ago, uh, again um, throughout the block. So complement is technically part of the innate immune response, but it can use components from the adaptive immune response to set off this proteolytic cascade that is really, really important for um, clearing um, antibodies that are um, already bound to a pathogen, for um, setting off proteolytic events that lead to the destruction of microbes. Um, but its main job, the most important thing it does, is create opsonins, and we'll talk about that in the notes. So here are kind of some general properties of complement. There's kind of a confusing nomenclature. All of the proteins in complement have this C designation, and there's um, proteins C1 through 9. They don't go in that order, because that would be too easy. It goes C1, C4, then 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So just one out of order. Okay. Then they break themselves down into pieces, A and B, and sometimes big B and little b. You don't necessarily need to know too much about that, but you can go through this just to kind of acquaint yourself with the vocabulary, okay? There are three pathways, classical, alternative, and mannose binding lectin. The classical uses an antibody. So go through this so that you understand what I'm talking about when I say the classical uses an antibody. That shifted over, let's move it back. All right, so now here's where it gets a little tricky. I made you guys videos to go through complement, right? So that you could actually see the pathway at work. I also list the steps in the complement pathway. I do not expect you to know the steps in each complement pathway. I am never going to ask you what happens after the C3 convertase cleaves C3 into C3B and C3A, but I will ask you, is C3B a powerful opsonin? The answer is yes. Um, so I give you the steps so that you know what's happening, but you don't actually need to know the pathway. It's just so that you can kind of conceptualize everything really well when I start talking about the important parts of fragments, and we'll get to that. The same can be said for the alternative pathway. Um, I made a video for that, and you can look through it. Um, the lectin binding pathway, I didn't make a video for because it's pretty much the same as the classical pathway, just instead of starting with an antibody and C1, it starts with the mannose binding lectin, which is a host protein that's created during your acute phase reactant um, phase in the liver. Okay, so then the cascade follows the same as the classical complement pathway. And here's also an image, so you can kind of see how they work. Again, you don't need to know every single step of this. What you do need to know, though, is this table. 
You need to know which fragment does which job. This table, you totally have to know. I'd like get a blank one and just memorize it. Um, and you need to understand opsonization. It is the most important biological activity of complement. Um, so make sure you understand that. All right, that's key. The other things you need to know are down in this table. There are patients who have deficiencies in complement. So what happens when you lack a complement protein? That you totally have to know. So this is another table I would spend a lot of time on. So again, don't worry about memorizing the order of the pathway, but do know these tables. Um, the reason for this also for me wanting you to know some of these um, fragments is that some of them are used diagnostically. So you'll see when we get to your hypersensitivity cases that, C that basically measuring C3A and C4A um, are actually ways that sometimes di uh, clinicians use to diagnose um, certain types of autoimmune diseases. So um, that's why you kind of have to be familiar with the fragments, okay? All right, um, then we're gonna move on to B cells, okay? So we're gonna make some antibodies. Um, so just like we did in Robert May, where we did VDJ recombination of T cells and we made T cells and many of you said, okay, I keep hearing about these B cells, like I should already know about them, but I don't. You're gonna know about them here. Um, watch the videos for these, they're helpful. You do need to kind of know the antibody structure. I'm not talking about like, do you know it's CH1, VH1. You need to know there's a heavy chain and a light chain and kind of this general structure. What do I mean by FC? What do I mean by FAB? Um, the difference between cleavage by papain and pepsin. Um, so go through that, make sure you understand that. If you don't, um, come and contact me. I've got some great analogies for it. Um, understand the different heavy chains and how that goes for isotypes, okay? This paragraph is something I spent some time understanding. Um, all right, then B cell development. We're gonna go through stages of B cell development again. Um, I'd like you to know the general order of B cell development. So that it does the heavy chain first, the light chain, and then you get eventually an immunoglobulin, that there's a kappa and a lambda chain. Um, a little bit more about stages. You have to know this stage in particular. Gotta know that one, and you gotta know this one. These are important stages. You have to know late pro B and large pre B, okay? Um, okay, so we go through kind of B cell development, alternative splicing. This is a really important concept. You're going to want to spend some time on this. I need you to understand basically how um, IgM and IgD are both expressed on the surface when the B cell is ready to leave the bone marrow. Um, selection, this is pretty similar to what goes on with T cells. Um, I want to kind of clarify a point here. So positive selection is kind of a misnomer for B cells. They still call it that, but it's not like with T cells where like you're trying to recognize the MHC. Um, it kind of occurs during those two checkpoints that we talk about in the large pre-B and the small pre-B chain. Really all it's doing is checking to make sure that it made a good heavy chain or it made a good light chain. If it doesn't make a good functional chain, the cell dies. And that's the entirety of its quote unquote positive selection. It's not really an important point. You don't necessarily get, need to get bogged down in it, um, but that's kind of what's meant by this paragraph. Um, negative selection, this goes into basically how fit the um, antibody is, its affinity, its avidity, understand those concepts, um, and whether or not it's going to survive or die. X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, got to know that one. Um, it's due to a Bruton's tyrosine kinase, got to know it. All right, these are those genetic mechanisms of diversity that I've talked about. So basically, we've got TCRs and we've got BCRs, and we need them to recognize an almost unlimited number of antigens. Um, so how do we do it? Um, and basically, my predecessor, Tom Lint, broke it down into these kind of five ground rules, these five mechanisms, and I take you through them here. Um, and the concept of cross-reactivity that sometimes we make a receptor that should be unique for an antigen and it might work on another antigen as well. So go through these, make sure you kind of understand them. Um, if you struggle with them, let me know and we can go through them. I'm not worried about you knowing every single detail, but I am worried about you understanding why we have these diversity mechanisms and how they work. Um, in here, there's all this like, RAG1, 2, recombination sequences, um, 
I think I even put in like, yeah, the 2312 rule, RSS, the gaps, nonomers, heptomers, whatever. You don't need to know any of that. That's extra detail to provide, um, you know, background. And every year students say one of two things. They say, well, why did you put all that information in the notes if I don't need to know it? And then there's another cohort of students that says, well, I need more detail or else I can't understand it. So this is my way of saying, for those of you who need detail, here it is. You can work through it and you can figure out the rules and why they work. For those of you who don't need detail, that's okay. Just understand the diversity mechanisms, all right? I'm trying to cover you both. All right, um, recombinational inaccuracy. This is kind of an interesting concept of um, diversity mechanisms. The immune system is the one place that genetics is like, go ahead and make a mistake. Let's see what happens. Because mistakes mean more antigen receptors. So understand this concept and know what TDT is. TDT is actually a pretty cool enzyme. So understand that one. Um, random assortment of chains. This is kind of an interesting concept. So understand how this kind of works, the global understanding of that. All right, now we're going to go into micro. Micro, we're going to talk about the Enterobacteriaceae. This is a really large, clinically important family of gram-negative bacteria. You need to know the general major characteristics of the Enterobacteriaceae. It's really important for differentiating them, and you need to understand McConkie auger, which I go into more detail here. Um, for the major structures, LPS you're already familiar with, but we go into kind of some of its structures, and that's because this O polysaccharide is part of how we type some of the different Enterobacteriaceae, particularly E. coli. Um, here's some virulence factors associated with it. Um, really, for the virulence factors, make sure you understand the capsule and the type 3 secretion system and the antigenic phase variation. And see how, what you can do with that. Like when we just thought about making antigen receptors, how does this kind of affect that? Um, then we go into each presentation of E. coli, and there are many. Um, you need to be able to recognize these. You need to be able to know your toxins every time um, and how it works and the different ways it presents. Um, so really, we're going to talk about ETEC. We're going to talk about EPEC. EAEC and STEC or EHEC. I would say that STEC, EHEC, um, and ETEC are kind of your big deals with that. Um, you need to know the sequelae that are associated with infections with these, the different types, um, serotypes that we might associate with disease, how we identify them, um, and treatment when it's recommended and when it's not. There are various places with some of these Enterobacteriaceae that we actually don't recommend antibiotic treatment, and then there are places where we do. Um, and part of that is because of the post-infectious sequelae. Um, then we go into Salmonella. That's another member of the Enterobacteriaceae. Similar thing. Make sure you know it. Make sure you know the clinical disease. Make sure you know the toxins. Make sure you, sure you know the treatment recommendations. Same goes for Shigella. Know your Shiga toxin. It shows up a lot. Um, Step likes it. Clinical disease, abdominal cramps, fever. And be able to kind of differentiate why we see certain patholo or pathophysiology in Salmonella or Shigella or E. coli that we don't see in the other ones. Um, we talk about Yersinia here. Um, Yersinia is actually the cause of the Black Plague, Yersinia pestis, but there's also a gastrointestinal variety of Yersinia known as Yersinia enterocolitica, and Yersinia is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae, so that's why we're covering it here. So go through those presentations just as you would before. And then here's Campylobacter jejuni, which is another of those comma-shaped um, organisms, gram-negative organisms. Um, so go through that just like you would for all the other organisms. Um, and then we finally do the viral gastroenteritides. I made these in one video. It's a little bit longer. I think it's like half an hour. Um, but I go into rotavirus and norovirus. Those are the two main um, viral gastroenteritides. So treat them kind of like you've been treating the bacterial infections. And that's it for this um, study module now. So here's your mastery or your CBCL study questions. And let me know if you have any questions, okay?